Hey all, I want to thank Pastor Brandon just for uh, inviting me here, getting to be with you guys. It's such a blessing. I wish we were here in person. I had the opportunity to be with you for a Bible study. I was supposed to come back for a Sunday in May, and obviously we all know where we are now, but I'm excited to have a word. I believe I have a word that's relevant for where you are and uh, just where we are as a people. Would you join me in the place of prayer? I like to pray before I teach. And then we'll jump right in. Awesome. So Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be able to sit at the feet of your word. I ask that it makes lasting impact and brings permanent transformation to our lives that we may never be the same again. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I have a simple message today that I entitle a new beginning, a new beginning. You see, the concept of a new beginning for some can cause anxiety. Your nerves get wrecked. We don't like change all the time. And so some folks feel like, man, you know, it's a new beginning. I don't know how I feel, but I'm just going to give you a little context because most people like to try to get new beginnings on their own and try to, I'm going to start something fresh. I'm going to get something new. In fact, it was a uh, wiki how the self-proclaimed website that teaches you how to do anything tells us that for some, when they think a new beginning, that means just change your scenery, take more breaks, exercise more, sleep more. Listen, we could all do, by the way, sidebar, we could all do the exercise more, but I packed on like 20 quarantine pounds. And so I get that. And so they're saying people will change their name, change their identities, change their name on their license. I mean, people will go all out of their way to try to concoct a new beginning. But the new beginning, beginning I'm referring to today is a beginning where you encounter Jesus as Savior. And if you are a, a Christ follower, when you get a new appreciation for what God has done in you, when you encountered him as Savior. So the new beginning I'm talking about is a change in the trajectory of our eternity. And so now we never graduate. We never move from the place but we forget the quality, the texture, the importance of what it means to have this new life in Christ. One person once said, the gospel is not the ABCs of Christianity, it's the A through Z of Christianity. And so I want to take a look at a couple verses, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. I'm going to be going there and reading it in a moment, but I just want to read, a, uh, I want you to understand what's going on because it's a good snapshot of the new beginning we get in Christ. And there's some reflections, I think, that'll help anchor us again if we are believers, but maybe you're not. It may give you a fresh look at what it means to get the change in the trajectory of your eternity. The historical context in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17, what's going on there was Paul was dealing with some folks in the church of Corinth that valued outer appearance. They valued how you look, how eloquent you were, how well you spoke. Now he's centralizing them to say, hey, uh, uh, he speaks to those things, but he's centralizing them to say, hey, our main concern is to have a gospel of reconciliation, reconciling man to God. And then he's unpacking how he's been compelled by love and how each and every one of us should be those reconcilers that he speaks about. Now I'm going to unpack the nutrients from 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17. Join me as I read it. It says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regarded him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Two verses rich with so much meaning. When I think of a new beginning, 
the first thing I think of a new beginning starts with a new perspective. That's what verse 16 is telling me. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. This is the Apostle Paul. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. And so this new perspective is this new perspective on the issue of sin according to the flesh, according to my carnality. I don't regard Christ as such. I don't regard Christ in such a way. You see, the Apostle Paul, he had a high view of Moses at the time, the Jews around his sphere of influence had a high view of Moses and a low view of Jesus. They thought Jesus just had some messianic complex that Jesus was just this, this guy that was walking around parading as if he, he, he thought he was the Messiah, but he really wasn't. And it's the Apostle Paul that goes on to say, hey, listen, I used to look at him the same way. I looked at Moses and, and Abraham and the forefathers greater than this Jesus who was a he was a fraud, but then he encounters him for himself in the same way, though. Some people still look at Jesus like a fraud. Some people still don't believe in who he is. Some people still think he was just a great person, a good person with good deeds, but not the Messiah. Some people still think he was just a prophet that had a prophetic edge, a wise teacher, but not the Messiah. But that's not Paul is saying at once I viewed him as such, but then he encounters him. And he realizes he's a hundred percent man. He's a hundred percent God. He no longer viewed him from the carnal way of life, just from his, his, his uh, background or ethnicity. He reviewed him and re I mean, revered him as savior. Rightfully so. John 14, six makes it clear that Jesus was Messiah. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. And so now the apostle views him as king. And if we're going to get this new perspective, it's saying I could no longer look at Jesus by what others say about him. I just read to you what he said about himself. And he has this wake up call and the apostle Paul speaks to the wake up call he had when he encountered Jesus. I no longer view him by the flesh the way others do. We are reminded that he's king. So if we're going to get a new beginning, that new perspective needs to start saying, us, he is king. He is Lord. We recognize my life is all about him. It was the astronomer Copernicus in the 1500s was the first to understand something. They, they call it the, the, the Copernicus kind of awakening where many people thought the sun revolved around the earth. And so they thought that, but it was Copernicus in the 1500s that said, no, that's not true. He found out it's the other way around. The earth revolves around the sun. And then they had the awakening. There's the difference. Listen, sometimes that's what it's like with our lives, with our own perspective. We think the world revolves around us. Jesus revolves around me. No, 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 no. When we encounter him and get that new perspective, like Copernicus, we realize my life should revolve around him. And that's the new perspective we need, that he's a God. That's not just a philosophy to be interpreted or understood, but a God to be encountered. And so I ask you again, have you seen him from a new perspective? No longer according to the flesh, but who he is. Which leads me to my second point because he gets into the, the juicy aspect of what it means because it's that new perspective. And then he goes on to say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Which leads me to my second way of capturing it. If we get a new beginning, that means we get a new identity. It calls for a new identity. It's one thing to have a perspective shift on who he is. It's another thing to say, I, I'm now a new creation in Christ. You're not what you used to be. You're not, you're not the fullness of that alone. You're a whole new entity. And he used some interesting words. 
Most scholars say when he uses that phrase, the new creation, it's very similar to Genesis 1 when darkness hovered over the land and the Lord spoke, let there be light. And when light went forward, there was an illumination and it's in the same way. There was a darkness that hovered over our soul. But when the gospel comes to impact us, it lights up. It illuminates the soul. Let there be light in our lives. And it's the illumination from dark to light again. Just like the word of God brought light onto the earth. It's God's word that remakes our lives again to illuminate his light. And I say we need a new identity, especially at a time when so many people find their identity elsewhere. There was a Gallup poll that went out not too long ago. They said approximately 55% of Americans get a sense of their identity from their jobs. And they said it's even more so if you're a college graduate. They said it can go up to at least 70% of people that get their identity from their jobs. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a solid job, doing a good job at your career and your vocation. There's nothing wrong with appreciating your culture and your ethnicity. I'm happy. I'm proud. I appreciate that I'm half African American, half Puerto Rican. I appreciate that I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. I appreciate all that about my identity, but the fullness of my identity cannot be found in those things. The fullness of my identity can only be found in the person of Christ Jesus. And Paul says, you get this new identity. Why? Because you're a new creation. You're new. There's nothing like you before. It's new. It's what God's done. It was the businessman, Lindsey Clegg in London. He tells this story on how he had to sell this factory that was all dilapidated and all jacked up. It was messed up. I'm telling you, he thought there's no way I'm going to be able to sell this piece of real estate. But all of a sudden, he got an interest call and a person that wanted to come see the, the, the factory that he was trying to sell, this old rundown factory. And the businessman who was well off, money wasn't an issue for him. He comes into the factory along with Lindsay. Lindsay's walking him through and he sees all this dilapidated stuff and let me just say you ever had that moment it's kind of like when somebody went to your house uninvited yeah, that's that's what Lindsay was feeling. You ever had somebody went to your house uninvited? Like you didn't have the time to wash down the, the 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 I mean, you know, wash the floors or clean the floors. You didn't have time to get to the dishes or whatever, put them, you know, put them away. You didn't have time. You ever had somebody come over uninvited? You trying to throw the socks underneath the couch somewhere. You trying to throw your sneakers in the corner so nobody sees it. You try to throw everything in the closet real quick. Like let me get this away. And, and you have that moment to say, oh, oh, oh I gotta I gotta over explain why stuff is kind of jacked up in my. House house like oh, I didn't expect you and Lindsay was feeling that same way when he's trying to sell this factory to this businessman there were broken windows and he's looking at the windows he's like listen if you buy this don't worry we'll, we'll take care of the windows he's over explaining we'll take care of the windows there was graffiti all over the place and he's like don't worry we'll, we'll, we'll clean the graffiti and, and, and he's over explaining there were mice and rodents that had corroded the building and he's like don't worry we're gonna take care of that if you decide to buy this building he's over explaining over explaining so finally the businessman just stopped him. He said, Lindsay, don't worry about it. I'll take it. Lindsay was like, oh, you'll take it. <laughs> he said, yep, I'm going to take it. I'm buying it, Lindsay. And he's perplexed. Like, why would you, you know, why would you want this? And so he just asked him, well, why would you buy this place the way it is? I don't got to make changes. Don't make any changes, he said. I'm buying it. And I quote what that person said to Lindsay, he said, when I buy this place, I'm going to build something completely different. I don't want the building. I want the site. Listen, we can't do the fixer upper with Jesus when we're a new creation. He's not saying, I want, we try to do fixer uppers. I'm going to fix the windows of my life. I'm going to fix the habits that I picked up. I'm going to fix my language. I'm going to fix all that. Then I'll come there. But Jesus is saying, hold on. I don't want the building. I just want the site. Why? Because he wants to destroy the very thing you think you are without him and build up something so brand new that that new identity would emanate that no matter what others say about you, 
what others think about you, you are a new creation. Jesus is not into fixer uppers. He's going to renovate the whole thing all over and destroy what was built up apart from him and build up something so fresh and so new and so unique that they'll say only God could have done that for you. That's what the new identity is about. That's what the new creation is about in that text, that, that we think it's a fixer-upper good works thing. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Just give me access to the sight of your heart and watch what I build in you and do through you. And it leads me to the next part in that text when he says, after he says, you are a new creation, he goes on to say, the old has gone. And when I, see, when I hear the old has gone, that means God is offering a new history, a new history. That almost sounds novel. I mean, that sounds like a paradox, a contradiction is different than a paradox, but it does sound strange. He offers a new history. He says, the old has gone. In essence, the old order of sin that ran our lives has gone. You have new ambitions that bring glory to God now, right? So the old order has gone. But now, yes, it's one thing to get a new perspective. It's another thing to get a new identity. But now the old has gone. So that means the past that I have is no, I no longer relate to the past the same way that I used to relate to my past. Why? Because when I look at my past, what I do, I plant the cross of Jesus Christ the day I encountered him in between me and my past. And I look at all my his history through the lens of Jesus to say, hey, I may not have done it that way way but all things are going to work for the good for those who are in Christ Jesus and so now my past starts to make more sense why because I get a new history that means I interact I don't look at my past from a place of condemnation I look at my past from a place of my tutor to say Lord I can see the inner workings of what you've been doing to get me to this place you see family this is not theory for me one of the skeletons in my closet, one of the dark places of my past that I wasn't happy about for many years is when I was 18 years old. It was six months before I gave my life to Jesus at the time. I was 18 years old. There was a young lady I was dating and she called me right out. We were dating and then I decided to like part ways and she called me about a week later and said, I'm pregnant. Let me tell you. Three words that have changed any person's life. When you hear that woman say, I am pregnant. And I had some type of Christian morality or upbringing, my mom being a Christian. And I always said, if I got a girl pregnant, I'm going to keep it. I didn't, I didn't really hold to abortion like that was an option. But that day, it all changed because when rubber met the road, when I had to deal with what I was at, I said, no, you have, to, you have to get the abortion. That young lady at the time, she wanted to keep the baby. And I almost persuaded her to the point where she had the abortion. Broke my heart. Broke her heart when she went through it. Wasn't happy about the decision. I was like, man, I can't believe I got to this place where I was so selfish and just how it impacted me. I didn't care what she was going to go through or anything. I talked her into the abortion. She had the abortion. It was tough. Years later now, I come to Christ six months later, but years later, my cousins with a young, a female friend of his, she's there. She was impregnated by a celebrity individual in the sports world. It was her boyfriend, but he's been cheating. And I remember sitting at that restaurant with her and my cousin and others. And she said, I'm thinking about having an abortion. Does anybody have an opinion on this? I said, hold on. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But let me share my story with you of how it impacted me. If I can do it again, I would have kept the child. I shared the story as if you know, I, what I just shared with you. Sure enough, she went on to keep the baby. Beautiful, beautiful child at this point. But the reason why I share that with you, why? Because I told you, when you get a new beginning, that's part of a new history. 
Instead of my past being the place of shame and the place of condemnation and the place of, man, why did I let that happen? I utilized that point in my history to be a tutor for somebody else. It became part of my testimony to bring others through. And I want to remind you, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you have gone through. You don't need to be shameful about that. Listen, if you've encountered Jesus for yourself, you stick the cross between your today and the rest of your past. And I I want you to view it from the place of the cross that God can utilize the most wicked of things for his glory if you just submit it to him. And so it's in the gospel. It's in that new creation. He doesn't make any mistakes. You you were you were you are right where you were for where you needed at the time. I'm not saying God made everything happen. I'm just saying that there's nothing that slips through the fingertips of God's sovereignty. And whatever history you have, you get a brand new one or a brand new way to relate to it through the cross of Jesus Christ. And so you get that new history. And my last and final point, I've been talking to you about new beginnings. And I said, hey, what does that look like? It looks like a new perspective, a new perspective on sin. Who is Jesus? It looks like a new identity. Why? I'm a new creation in him. It looks like a new history. What do I mean by that? Not that the history changed, but now I never view it simply from my own carnal, normal lens. I view it from the cross of Christ and how he can utilize it for his glory. And lastly, a new beginning comes with a new home. That's what he says. After he says the old has gone, he says the new has come. It culminates in this, there's a newness that's come. When we're reconciled to Jesus through his work on the cross. Yeah, we have new passions, we have new desires, but there's eschatological implications on this phrase, the new has come. In essence, the new has come and it's still coming. We get a new home. Heaven is our home. We don't have to flip flop. We don't have to wonder, is Jesus with me today if he's gone tomorrow? We don't have to wonder, am I eternally secure in him? We can say, listen, when he brings a dead thing to life, when he's truly brought a dead thing to life, you get that new home in heaven. And when you're informed by that, we're not just living and and, and skedaddling and just living life all frivolously until we get to heaven. Like, Lord, just take me, take me. No, we're saying, listen, when you get a hold of the new home, when you get a hold that heaven is your home, when you get a hold that now I, I got something to look forward to in eternity future, you can also be informed in eternity present. Because when I understand that heaven is my home, there's a courageousness that comes about. There's a hope that comes about. There's a sense that, that what I'm facing right now doesn't have the last laugh. It doesn't have the last word. It doesn't have the last aspect or the last talking point on my life. This doesn't have to be the last chapter. I can be filled with hope. Why? Because I'll never be comfortable here on this side of the heavens fully. I will honestly say, I think sometimes the, the Lord allows hardship like the hardship we're going through now with COVID. He allows these times or personal hardship or relational hardship to remind us that it will never feel like heaven here. There will always be a longing in the soul of a believer for a greater home, a more perfect home, a more pronounced home with that person, Jesus Christ, when we have this big new beginning. And I want to just remind you that that is your home. But what do I do with that information? I remind you again to have hope and to have courage in your present day because your new home is secured. I know there's been a lot of theological questions about Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King, and what he believes so on and so forth. And I'm not here to debate that, but I do find some very powerful words on his last talk on April 3rd, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. I believe he got a glimpse of what it means to have some type of eternal security, an, an eternity of a new home. That's what gave him the courage that he had at that time. And he says these words, what I think is a good picture of hope and encouragement in light of the new home. He says in his last speech, like anybody, 
I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And so he ends with that and he says, I've seen something. I've seen that I have this new home. I've seen that I'm secure. So there's nothing on earth that can steal that from me. There's no demon in hell. There's no trial I'm facing. There's no COVID that I need to fear that can steal the security of this new home. And it reminds me of Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed in us. We're secured, family. We get a new home, family. I just wanted to take the time to bring us back to the simplicity of the new beginning we get in Christ. So if you've never met him, would you consider him as savior, trading your sin and your brokenness in for his salvation? But if you are in Christ, sometimes we forget, sometimes We're like the man that looks in the mirror, walks away, and forgets how he looks. And so I'm here to remind you that you have encountered him. We get that new perspective. He's God. Whatever area that he's not reigning in your life, claim his lordship over that area fresh. We get that new identity. Some of us think the new identity means I need to get a fixer up or I need to add more good works. I need to do more good things. No, no, no. The new identity means I'm, I, I just, I'm knocking down the building. I just want access to the site. He's building something new in you. We get a new history. Not that our past is not relevant. In fact, it's very relevant. But we don't look at it just as our past. We look at it through the cross, the lens of the cross. and say, God can redeem even the worst of the mistakes I've made. And lastly, we get a new home. When we grab a hold of this truth that heaven is our home, fear can't live there anymore. That gives me hope. That gives me encouragement. And that gives me courage for today. That there's something greater for me in him. I want to pray with you where you are. If you're here, and you've been listening, you're ch- chimed in, you're saying, Pastor, I've, I've, I've lost a sense of who I am in Christ. I've picked up some bad habits toward COVID. I've picked up some unhealthy perspectives. I just want to pray with you right now where, where you are to recenter you on the richness of what it means to be that new creation in him. Maybe you're saying, I'm not living like I'm a new creation. I'm going back to some old things. How about we start fresh today? Why don't you pray with me as I pray over you, right where you are. So Jesus, I just ask that anyone under the sound of my voice on the other side of this screen, maybe that picked up some bad habits, went to some unhealthy relationships or unhealthy practices. I just pray, Lord, for a freshness. Break that stuff off of us. We repent of anything that's not like you that we've allowed access to in our lives. And I just pray that we have such a confidence in the new creation. May you remind everyone on the other side of this screen that they're fearfully and wonderfully made by you, that you're doing a new thing in them. And may they walk in the richness of that newness. May they fall in love with you again. May they be reminded that they don't have to live the way they've been living. They don't have to follow in the habits that they've fallen into. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And no matter what others say about them or even what they think about themselves, may they be reminded they have a new identity in you and that they're a new creation. It's in Christ's name we pray.
Amen. Amen. Well, family, I hope and I look forward to the time I get to see you guys in person one day as I get to come alongside this, this body epiphany that I love so much. Enjoy the rest of the week. See you soon.